God bless you. How are you doing? Just came to tell you this morning that the Lord hasn't forgotten about you. And that when he's silent, he is working on your behalf. And sometimes it doesn't make sense what he does or allow, but he knows what he's doing. You haven't been forget, forgotten. We left last time when we were getting out of Egypt, and we got to the, in, right in front of uh, the Red Sea, and the Bible tell, tells us that Moses stood up there, did what the Lord told him to do, lift up the rod, and the sea opened up into, and they walk on dry land. And we also saw that when you obey the Lord, when you, regardless of how senseless it might be sometimes, and how irrational the route that he has chosen for you may seem, if you keep walking with him, one day you will look back and say, thank you, Lord. Amen. We don't get it now. Because we are in the middle of the storm. But one day, just like Joseph, the ways of the Lord are understood when you look backwards. You never understand when you are in the middle of the, of the mess. The Bible says that they took him, put him in a pit, then they sold him, they went to, he went to jail. But at the end, he said, no, 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 don't be afraid. The Lord brought me here. But it took some time. And John 13, 7 says, what I do, you do not understand it now, but you will understand it later. So, you are in our prayers, and I will tell the teens as we, in our service later on, to pray for all of you, for those who have lost loved ones, for all, for all those that are going through tribulations and problems, and you don't see a way out. Even though you may see the, the sea closed, the Lord will open a way out of no way. Hold on and keep on walking. Amen? Amen. From the sea, of God, uh, from the sea, they cross, they get to the other side, and they start singing. And you will imagine that after parting the sea and making this great miracle, people will be praising, and it will be simply blessing after blessing, but Amazingly, as soon as they get to the other side, the people started complaining once more, immediately after the 10 plagues, after the 10 plagues. So we saw and said also that sadly there are some people that it doesn't matter what you do, they will always complain. And if you eat, they are like vampires in a blood bank. They are accustomed to that. They grew up doing that. And they go to church to do that. And they live in your life doing that. They, 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 there is a short story about a bat. You know the bat, right? The, those who do that. And uh, there was a dry. They didn't, they, they didn't have blood. And they needed to, 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 to drink in order not to die. And so one of them came from there with blood all over the place, blood in the, in the mouth and blood in the chest and blood all over. And the others came and told him, where did you find blood? Where did you find blood? And he said, it's easy. You see that wall over there? Yes. You see that big wall? Yes. I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. It happens. There are, as soon as they cross, immediately they complain. Amazing. How is it possible after 10 plagues? It, it, it seems like you have no room to doubt, yet the first thing that they do when they get to the other side of the road, of the sea, is to complain and murmur against God and against Moses. I will give you an advice. Um, 
that I, I learned the hard way. Somebody said, I don't know what is the secret to uh, success in life, but I know the secret to failure. The secret to failure is trying to please everybody. They will destroy you, and in your funeral, they will work hard to get another victim. There are things that you need to be like Isaiah, blind and deaf. Otherwise, your heart health, your cardiac health, is that how you say it? Will suffer. Your brain will suffer. And we learned last week that you are not a cat. That you only have one life. There are some people whose life... The, the devil got you and now he's trying to get me through you. It ain't going to happen. Sorry, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so from the Mount, from the Red Sea to Mount Sinai, they got there in 50 days. 50 days it took them. And when they get to the Mount Sinai, to Mount Sinai, Something happens, and is that God gave ten commandments. These ten commandments, one of them, or at least two of them, have to do a lot with the Egyptian gods. Because God knew that they got out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. That's the problem. That is why we have what we have in so many places. That some people got out of the world, but the world is still in them. And so God knew that they got out of Egypt, but Egypt was intact in them still. And God knew that despite of the whole ten plagues, they still have a lot of Egypt in them. And so the, he says this. When he gets to the Mount Sinai and he descends 50 days later, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God. Amen. Amen. This verse, we have seen it from a Christian perspective, and we have never seen it using the glasses of the Egyptians, of the ancient Egyptians. This verse is speaking against the Egyptian gods. And not only that, it's saying where they live. You remember that we saw that in the plagues. Look at it now. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. In heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. These are the exact places where the Egyptian gods used to live. A brief, um, a brief uh, view of this situation. The habitat of the gods. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of, form of anything in heaven above. A few of the gods that live in heaven above, according to the Egyptians, were Horus, Shu, and Nut. They live in heaven above. But then he says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything on earth. And some of the gods that lived on earth were Nefret, Apis, and Geb. Apis is the... Uh, is the bull that they were worshiping. These gods live on the earth. But he mentions also beneath. And the gods that live on, in the underworld or beneath were Osiris, Anubis, and Toth, among others. But then he also mentioned you shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in the waters below. And in the waters below, we have Tauret, we have Happy, and we have Sobek. Sobek being a god crocodile 
Tauret being a goddess, the first one, that was half hippo, half crocodile, and also half leper. And happy was the god that was at the door of the river Nile. He was the guardian. So no one could go into the Nile without his permission. Guess what? The Lord got in there despite of the fact that, despite of the fact that Happy was there. So Happy was taking care of the gate, that's what they call it, the entrance. And in the ancient world, for you to take over a city, the first thing that you have to do was to take over the gates. Remember that? So you break the gate and you are in the city. Now, Happy is taking care of the gate of the house of the gods. And Jehovah comes in, breaks the gates, takes the city, and takes all the gods. All of that is happening in these verses and much more. So he said, the waters below. When they see that, when they see this verse, they are thinking, heaven above is Horus. On the earth, we have Geb. Above the earth, we have Osiris. And in the waters, we have Tauret and the others. This is a command that is directly against worshiping the Egyptian gods. And they understood it clearly. When we read it today, we don't see it like that. But when they saw it, they saw the whole pantheon of the Egyptian gods in front of them. But this is the thing about God now. It's the first time that God is saying no to them. Don't. You will not do that. It's the first time. He hasn't done that now. But you know why he can say no now? Because he has the moral authority to say no. He has shown whom he is now, and he can tell them no. There are some people that say no too fast. They give orders too fast. And it's like going to a cash machine without having any cash in the bank. You cannot come and say no before you provide a good solution to the problem. And he says now, now he can say no. Why is God allowed to say no? Why did he wait too, so long? 50 days. Every time was yes, yes, yes. But for the first time, he says, no, we are not going to do that. I would suggest a few reasons why. Number one, he can say no now. Because they know he is a God that fights for them. And God is a God that fights for you. And some of you are worried about your teens, your daughters, or the circumstances that were mentioned this morning. The Bible says, stay quiet, this fight belongs to me. He said, be quiet and let me be God. He also says, I will fight for your children. Sometimes our fight is to go on our knees and say, I love my daughter. I love my son. But I know you love him more. Therefore, I put it in your hands. That's your fight many times. Sometimes your fight will be to kneel down and cry without saying a single, way, a single word. But just the fact that you kneel down, that was a victory already. So now he says no. They wanted to, to worship them, but he says no. But why? Because he fought for them. He got into the mud with them. He faced Pharaoh for them. He showed them that he loved them as he loves you and cares for you and fights for you even when you don't feel it. And you don't see it. And it makes no sense. And takes you through weird roots. You remember the vast desert of the Philistine, remember? And that he went all the way down? 
It was plain. If they would have gone straight, Pharaoh would come, surround them, and kill them. But he took them all the way down because they were surrounded by mountains. And it was difficult for Pharaoh to surround them because it was, it was narrow. They have to go one after the other, one behind the other. They couldn't surround. God saw that. Moses didn't see it. The Israelites didn't see it. But God saw it. And God is seeing your case too. The Bible says, I have heard and I have seen and I'm coming down to fight for them. He has seen you and he has heard you and he's coming down to fight for you. He fought for them. He protected them. And when somebody protects you and put his neck or her neck in the guillotine, that person has earned the right to say, I think we shouldn't. He protected them in the same way that he's protecting you that are confused and in pain. But I will repeat again, there will be a day with a big scream that he, in which he will tell you, that is why I did it. You cry and you got angry at me because that's what you wanted, but this is the reason why I said no. I protected you. Remember Lulu? <laughs> some of us, some of us here should have been gone or crazy and God has protected you. Amen. You know where you come from. And you know you shouldn't be here seated right now. And you are here because he protected you. He opened a way for them when there was no way, when they thought it was all over, when they thought it was lost, when everybody was against them, when their friends were betraying them and gossiping about them and murmuring about them and treating them like he had leprosy when they turned their back on them. When Pharaoh saw, I have you in my hands, when the devil was about to strike, he opened a way and said, that's my daughter and she's not alone. That's my son and he's not alone. He opened a way, an unexpected way. Help came from the most unexpected way and this is exactly how it will come in your life. You will see that the people you thought will be on... <laughs> There are some weird things in planet Earth. <laughs> the people that you thought will be supporting you and carrying you are the ones stabbing and eating your flesh. And someone that doesn't even know you is the one standing for you, open a way, opening a way for you from the most unexpected places. The sea. Please take me back all the way through the desert because it makes it. No, no. Let's open the sea. And, and I imagine just they, they just well, okay. He says, so let's go. He opened a way for them. Why was he able to say no? Because he exposed the inability of these gods. He said, they cannot save, but I can save. And I use the word expose because there are many, many, many who believe that God was attacking the gods. And in a sense, there was a war. But God was more interested in exposing them. He was saying, well, you are happy, the God of the Nile. And it is believed that if I go into your river, you will attack me. I will go into the river to see what happened. Oops, nothing happened. Yahweh won again. It was a boxing match. You know that I used to, I don't want to boast about that, you know, because I want to stay humble, you know. But when I was a child, I was boxing, but not boxing professional or anything like that. It was just people have gloves and you will put them and you will start uh, fighting there. And I was called the thunder. You, oh, yeah. <laughs> Babe, that was... Thunder. They knew th 
thunder is in the rim. This will not last. People, what do you think about it, Jerry? Well, you know that when thunder is in the rain, it will not last. It will be seconds when the fight is over. That's right. What about here? How is it going there, Jerry? Yes, Tom, we are right here with thunder, and the guys are about to fight, and we know it will not last more than five seconds because we know thunder. Well, they call me thunder. It wasn't because I knocked the other fast, but because I went down fast. That's what. <laughs> That's the last time I put the globes, I saw the floor coming towards my face. <laughs> and the only thing I heard the guy saying was, rus, 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 rus. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Never again. I said, I'm, no, no, thank you. I'm going to do push ups from now on. <laughs> it's okay. If that's how I'm going to become a millionaire, I see myself being poor. Because I saw that floor coming towards my face. That's right. So thunder was exposed there. God is not fighting and attacking. He's exposing. He's saying, let's see if they work. Given the fact that you worship them so much, given the fact that you have given your heart to them, given the fact that you trust them so much, and that you have bowed down to them, and that you have given the key of your heart to them, let's see if they work. And I suggest to you that if your gods are not working, you change and switch, switch, switch to Jehovah. That's what he's saying. So he's exposing. And at the end, he said, look, they couldn't save. Their gods let them down, remember? And our gods and anything that we have put there in the place of God will let us down. Because he is only, he, he only is God. There is only one. And nothing else, there is, there is that space in us. That belongs to him only. And whatever is sitting there will not last too long. It will fail you. The church will fail you. Humans will fail you. But don't get angry or mad at them. It is necessary that it happen. In order for you to stop worshiping them. In order to, for you to land on planet earth. And walk realistically in life. That's why it happened. So he exposed the inability of them. 50 days later, the gods of the Egyptians were like many pills for many things, many vitamins. So for uh, the sun, they have one. For the rain, they have another. Uh, for the dry, they have another. So it's like having many pills at the table, many vitamins. What God is saying is, we, going, we are going to change the prescription, and from now on, you are going to take only one pill. Everything that they were to you, I am going to be to you. And so you have God of the sun like Horus. He said, I will be your light. You have Imhotep, that is the God of the medicine. He said, I will be your doctor. And one by one, God's award, no, I will fight for you. And he becomes everything that they were to, the gods were to them, he becomes that to them until you don't need them anymore, I am with you. That's what he did 50 days later after getting out of Egypt. And you know what happened? That was 50 days after the death of the lamb in Egypt. Remember that night when Moses killed the lamb and they had the Passover? They arrived to Mount Sinai in the month called Sivan. In, like in our calendar, the Israelites have 12 months. Um, they are Abib, Sif, Sivan, Tammuz, Ab, Elul, Etanin, 
Heshvan o Mar Heshvan, Kislev, Tebet, Sebat y Adar. Twelve months. And they arrived in the third one, that is Sivan, 50 days later, after the death of the Lamb. Do you know what happened when Christ came here 50 days later after Calvary? After the cross? Something happened 50 days later after the death of the Lamb when Christ came. The Bible says that after he died, he walked for 40 days. Remember that? Talking to the disciples and talking to, to the others. And then he said, go to Jerusalem and stay there. And all of them, the Bible says, were in the same place, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And they lasted 10 days there in that place. And on the 10th day, making it in total 50, 40 days walking and 10 days waiting. 50 days after the crucifixion, the Holy Spirit came down on the room. That was the second Sinai. It was the other Moses delivering the people once more, setting the captives free from the other Pharaoh. And the Bible says that they were together. And they had 10 days. And in those 10 days, they started saying, I want to ask for forgiveness to Brother James because I thought about killing him. And then Peter and Simon, the Zealot, remember? There was a Zealot, Zealot, and Zealots hated publicans. And Simon, the Zealot, the, how do you say, Zealot or Zealot? Zealot, got up with the knife in the hand and said, I wanted to hurt Brother Matthew right here. I hated him. I couldn't see him. And one by one started confessing one another and asking for forgiveness from one another and putting their differences and mistakes aside. Do you know something about hatred and holding a grudge against somebody? Once I was in planet Jupiter being a pastor and there was somebody who said, I hate that person, I cannot see. I know that doesn't happen here, and I know that we don't come all the way from home to camp meeting just to avoid some people. Have you seen that they're coming, they go that way then, they say like, <laughs> and, and you pretend like you forgot something, and that you have to rush back to your flat, and then you look to see if the person is gone, <laughs> just to sit there next to the person or behind. We know that that doesn't happen here. But in Jupiter, Jupiterians are difficult people. And I was called and said, Pastor, I want to call, I want to talk to you and tell you that I hate brother such and such. And I would like, and yes, I said, I congratulate you for saying that. So thank you very much for saying it. What would you like to do about it? I would like to talk to him. But I would like you to go first and talk to him and tell him that for the last 15 years, 15 years hating somebody, that's a lot of emotional health, a lot of insomnia. That's a lot of high blood pressure. That's a lot of pains in the belly. That's a lot of headaches. And, and, and stomachs and nose aches and all aches. And I went to the brother and said, brother, I have something to tell you. He said, what happened? Brother such and such told me to tell you that he wants to talk with you because he hates you. <laughs> and he was, he has been hating you for the last 50 years. Which means that when he started hurt, uh, hating you, I was 
Fletcher years old. Do you hear my age? I'm not going to repeat it. No, 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 no. No. And you know what he told me? He said, really? He hates me? But I like him so much. And I find him so kind and so nice. Which means that this person has been hurting himself for the last 15 years, hating somebody that even didn't, that even didn't notice that. He even didn't notice that he was hated. This person was just like the blood pressure, like in Jupiter happens. The Sabbath is a happy Sabbath until that sister comes in the Sabbath, Sabbath school. Then your neurons go boom, and the person doesn't even know it. And you are killing yourself. Angry, without joy. That person owns you. That person is God in your life and has the power to control your mood, the weather in your life. That person has just to show up for you to be down. There are some people that come with dirty shoes and walk in the white carpets of your mind because you gave them the key. Because no one will do that unless I say, you can come and mess my brain. We have given. Nobody's making you angry. You are angry. You have given them the key. And it's time to say enough is enough in the name of Jesus. And get back your life. To close, they were all there confessing. And hugging one another and crying. And they texted, call Julius because I need to talk to him. And when God saw that, the Bible says, 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came down and baptized them, all of them. And you know what else the Bible says? Every day, people came and were baptized and joined the church. You know why? Because the church was a safe place. And God said, now I can bring people to this church. Do you know why God doesn't send some people to some churches? Because if he sent people to those churches, they will become atheists. There are some churches that are the perfect place for you to stop believing in God. But it's up to us to change it, and we are going to change it in the, in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen? They don't need to change. I need to change. Amen. Don't blame anybody. Don't look at anybody. Don't say that it is not happening because that one is not doing and that the other is not doing. You will start doing. Amen. You will start changing. Amen. I'll close with this. I was in another planet, <laughs> pastoring in Pluto. <laughs> Plutonians, you don't know. They are red and have antennas and all these things. And there was a sister always complaining about the tables. The tables were dirty. And the tables were ugly. And the tables were bad. And the tables were ugly. And the tables and the tables and the tables. Until one day the Lord touched me and I fell and I did like this. Oh, that's the Lord. Let me go there and say, sister... I declare in the name of Jesus, I did it. Oh, Lord, yes, give me this. I told her, she was standing there saying, in the name of the Lord, <laughs> you have the ministry of cleaning the tables. <laughs> You've been called to fix that thing that bothers you so much. It has been a long time. And let me tell you that the ministry of cleaning tables is still on. <laughs> the things that bother you are your call. It's not for you to go out there and complain and fight. It's for you to fix them. That's what happened to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It bothered him so much to see the vision that he fought for unity. Sometimes the Lord will allow you to be, to see, to, to see things that will bother you because he wants you to fix them and to help. 
That's why 15 days later, they were together and the church changed. The devil is not afraid of a church that speaks so much about uh, theory and a church that is well knowledge in doctrine. Uh, he's not worried about a church that had a lot of information. He's afraid of a church that wants transformation. We have a lot of churches with a lot of information and little transformation. He's afraid of a church that in which, in, in a, of a church where people love one another and they forgive one another. That is the fear of the devil. When you get to that point, then he will shake. While we are just talking and complaining, he's okay, that's his job. But the day when we say, let's stop hating, let's get together, let's unite, that day God will look down and say, now I can send my spirit and will baptize you with his Holy Spirit and will keep on guiding you. So my prayer this morning is that we give God his church back. That we give back, how would you say that? Do uh, you know what I mean, right? That the church is not ours and that we need to give it back to God. Yes. That we need to allow God to be God in his church. Yes. We are the Laodicea. Remember that? Yes. Laodicea is the only church that doesn't have God. God is outside and it's time for us to allow him to come in. Yes. There was an, a... And that was in England. That was not in Pluto. <laughs> there was an elderly lady that was a Christian, and she was very, very kind. And there were a group of youth that were always poking her and, and, and mocking her. And the story says that Queen Victoria will come and stop and have tea in her house and then go. And this elderly lady was always talking about Jesus and talking about Jesus and talking about Jesus. And the youth said, you know what? We're going to get her now. Let's go there and talk to her. And then they went and said, uh, miss. And she said, yes, sister, tell me one thing. Who has been the greatest guest that you have had in your house? And she said, the greatest guest that I have had in my house, that's easy. That is Queen Victoria. And they said, we got you. You see, you're always talking about Jesus and Jesus this and Jesus that. We were, we, you were supposed to say that Jesus was the greatest guest that you had in your house. And she said, no, no, no. The problem is that Jesus is not a guest in my house. He lives in my house. Yeah. It's time for us to allow him, not only in the yard... And in the living room, but invite him to take over the whole house. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.